after watching this video lecture, students will be able to balance, balance nuclear uh, equations um, involving alpha and beta particle decay. You'll also be able to identify and diagram what's happening uh, in both an alpha particle or beta particle de decay process. You'll be able to identify half-life and utilize graphs to determine half-lives. And you'll be able to compare and contrast, contrast nuclear fusion and fission. In this lecture, we're going to be focusing on um, two types of radioactive decay mainly, um, but there are three different types of uh, particles that we need to be familiar with. So first of all, we have alpha particles. Um, those are products associated with alpha decay processes. Um, beta particles um, are part of beta decay processes. Um, and gamma rays are actually high energy um, electromagnetic radiation that is released during some types of radioactive decay. So uh, we're going to focus mostly on the first two, um, although these come up in some of our discussion. So if we go ahead and look at uh, alpha particles first, okay, so alpha particles um, are actually uh, two protons and two neutrons that become bound together and leave a nucleus during um, an alpha particle decay process. Okay, um, so alpha particles are represented uh, by this symbol here, okay, um, and they actually have a plus two charge, and the reason why is because they have two protons but don't have any electrons. Um, this type of decay process is seen with uh, really heavy elements or heavier elements, um, and what happens is you have a larger nucleus, um, and basically it decays down to a lighter nucleus and that alpha uh, particle. So when diagramming um, your alpha particle decay, you can use the specific examples um, that are provided here um, in this diagram, or you can use descriptors like um, larger nuclei, okay, smaller nuclei, okay, and then your alpha particle. Okay, so um, it's up to you how you want to do it. You just need to make sure that you're either using the example here or um, the more generic uh, descriptors. What you should be noticing here um, is that when we go from the heavier nuclei um, or the larger nuclei to the smaller nuclei, um, what ends up happening is uh, the original nucleus is actually changing in terms of uh, how many protons and neutrons are present. So because we are losing um, that alpha particle, we're actually losing two protons and two neutrons. Okay, and that gets reflected in our mass number here. Um, and if you go and look at um, neptunium on the periodic table, you will see um, the number of uh, protons in that nucleus is two less than the original parent atom here. Okay, so um, that's an alpha um, particle decay process and the corresponding diagramming. So let's go, on, go ahead and look at uh, beta decay processes. Okay, so first of all, beta particles um, are produced during beta emission processes. Okay, and basically a beta particle is an electron that gets em emitted from the nucleus during, you know, some types of radioactive decay. Okay, and that should sound weird to you immediately because we all know that electrons are not um, occupying the nucleus. Um, so there's a little bit... Um, it's a little bit of a strange process, but what ends up happening is that a neutron in um, the nucleus is converted into a proton and an electron. The proton remains behind and the electron leaves. So beta particles are actually represented by either this symbol or this symbol. You can use either or. Um, and that's how we get to the point where an electron is leaving the nucleus. Okay, so that is what a beta, beta particle is. So if we go ahead and we look at our examples here, um, what you'll notice is that um, you have a specific nucleus, okay? Um, the beta particle actually leaves that nucleus. And so remember, we're exchanging a um, neutron for a proton. So your mass number, right, the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus are not going to change. But your atomic number is going to increase by one. So you do change the identity of the element, um, but the mass number is going to remain the same in this process. So um, again, uh, when you're diagramming these guys, you want to make sure that you're uh, indicating, you know, some sort of specific example. You want to show that the mass number is remaining the same um, and that the 
um, atomic number is increasing by one. Okay, so this is uh, how beta emission works, um, and this is the diagramming that would be expected. All right, so balancing nuclear equations, we're going to be obviously balancing for alpha and beta emission processes. Okay, so the two rules you're going to be following are, first of all, that the sum of the mass numbers Okay, so remember the superscripts up top. So the sum of the mass numbers uh, on both sides of the arrows have to be equal. Okay, and then the same thing has to be true for the atomic numbers. Right, so generically speaking, if you're told you have an alpha emission that's happening, you know you're going to produce an alpha particle. Okay, so this arrow um, divides reactants and products. So an alpha emission, one of the products is an alpha particle. Same thing for beta emissions. Okay, you have a beta particle that's being represented as a product. You're also going to obtain new nuclei, um, and of course you have your starting material. Well, let's go ahead and do some examples. So uh, we're going to need our periodic tables here, so go ahead and get your periodic table out. So we've been told that thorium-223 is an alpha emitter. Okay, so not only are they telling us the element we're starting with, it also tells us what type of emission balancing we're going to be doing. So it's an alpha emitter, so we know we're going to have an alpha particle. Okay, so we write in our alpha particle as a product. Okay, we know thorium, element symbol TH, um, they provided the mass number, so 223. And then we go to our periodic table. We find thorium on the periodic table. Okay, it has an atomic number of 90. Okay, so remember, according to uh, the rules that we discussed, right, the um, uh, mass numbers on both sides of the arrows have to be equal. Okay, so the sum of what's going on on the right has to equal what's going on on the left. And the same is true for atomic number. Okay, so um, if I look at my mass number here, right, that's a 4. Okay, so 4 plus what gives me 223? Okay, so that's going to be 219. Okay, so 219 is going to be my new mass number. Same thing's going to be true for uh, my atomic number. So what plus 2 gives me 90? Okay, that's going to be 88. Okay, now we're going to then take our atomic number um, for our new product, and we're going to find it on the periodic table. So if you go ahead um, and you look that up, you will see uh, that our A, okay, or um, radium, is going to be your new product in this alpha decay process. Okay, so... Um, you can double check yourself, so 219 plus 4 gives you 223, 88 plus 2 gives you 90, um, and now you have a balanced equation um, for this nuclear process. Okay, same thing's going to be true for um, your iodine-139 down here. Um, same process, except in this case they told us that we have a beta emitter. Okay, so beta emitters are going to give you beta particles. Uh, we have indicated that um, there. Okay, um, and then we're going to go ahead and go through the exact same process. So they told us that we had iodine-139. They gave us that um, mass number. If we go ahead and we look on our periodic table, iodine has a um, atomic number of 53. Okay? And so we know that uh, the, for beta emissions that the mass number doesn't change, this, uh, doesn't change at all. It stays the same. Okay? So we know that that's going to be the case, and it makes sense because 139 plus 0 gives us 139. Um, and then we know uh, if we go ahead and continue with uh, the... Uh, atomic numbers, we know that in a beta decay, we know that a um, neutron is being swapped out and producing a proton and an electron. Um, so we know that the number of protons is going to increase by one. Okay, so 54 is what we're going to have as our atomic number um, for our product. Okay, 54 plus negative 1 is going to give us 53, which totally makes sense. And then what we're going to do, we're going to look at the periodic table, look at the atomic number, and C non is what we end up with for our um, product in this beta decay process. So now you guys are able to balance nuclear equations. Um, make sure that you're able to write uh, your alpha and beta uh, particles. Um, they will not be provided to you on quizzes and tests, but basically this is balancing um, for nuclear equations. So let's go ahead and talk about half-life. Okay, so half-life is represented by T with the subscript one-half. Um, and half-life is the time it takes for half of the atoms of a radioactive nuclei to decay. So if I have a sample, um, the time it takes for half of the atoms in that sample to decay into something else is going to be your half-life. And some half-lives, guys, are really, really slow. So carbon-14, it has a very, very long half-life. Um, and we use uh, carbon-14 for radiometric dating, you know, figure out how old bones are or artifacts are. 
okay um and there's also other um radioactive nuclides that decay really really quickly so this polonium 214 okay it just exists for you know almost a couple hundred microseconds so we have really fast uh uh half-lives in some uh situation then we have really slow in others so if we go ahead and we were to look at this graph um i want you guys to kind of get familiar with um, some things you should be looking for when you're using a graph to determine a half-life. Okay, so first of all, um, they gave us the mass or the original quantity of our substance. So we have 10 grams here, okay? And remember, half-life is the time it takes to decay to half the original quantity. So if I have 10 grams here, when I reach 5 grams, that's going to be the occurrence of my first half-life. Okay, so if I look at that, I come across, it's about 5 grams. Um, I extrapolate down, that's about 27 years. So the half-life of the strontium-90 is going to be 27 years. So 27 years later, okay, we should be at about 2.5 grams, okay, which is half of the 5 grams we started with. And then half of this, 27 years later, um, will decay, and you'll have 1.25 grams left over. So... Um, using these graphs, you know, you want to figure out how much you start with, how long it takes to get to the halfway mark, and then that should repeat over and over. Okay, so now let's go ahead and let's discuss nuclear fission and fusion. All right, so nuclear fission um, is basically a nuclear reaction where you're taking a um, slightly unstable uh, uh, radioactive um, element and you're striking it with a neutron, okay? And when you strike it with a neutron, it's going to break down um, into more neutrons, um, smaller uh, uh, nuclei, and a bunch, a bunch of energy, okay? And so um, the typical um, element that you'll see used in uh, nuclear reactors is uranium-235, although there are different um, types of reactors um, that are used in our country and outside of our country. Um, but basically, you'll take the uranium-235, and it'll make these really... Um, neat rods, okay, that are then able to be exposed or um, isolated um, from neutrons. Uh, neutrons are fired at uh, the, um, the rods that contain the uranium-235, um, and basically when the neutron strikes uh, the nuclei, the uranium-235 nuclei, um, basically it splits, and it splits into these smaller fission products, the neutrons, and then of course, as I said earlier, lots of energy. And so, um, the way that this works is that by ex uh, by exposing the rods to these neutrons, um, what ends up happening is that you know one of the neutrons hits uh, one of the target nuclei, it breaks, and because it produces more neutrons, um, those neutrons then strike other um, uranium-235 atoms that are in the rods, and then that causes those to break. And basically, you get this chain reaction, um, and the nuclear reactors... Um, basically harness the heat energy that's produced uh, during um, these decays and uh, subsequently that uh, heats up water which powers turbines which subsequently produces electricity. So that energy that's being harnessed and turned into electricity um, is actually really really efficient. So like one pound of highly enriched uranium is basically equivalent to like a like a million uh, gallons of gasoline. Which, if you think about that, you know, that's a lot of energy that's being produced um, from such a small quantity of energy or quantity of, of substance. Now, um, when we're diagramming these for lectures and stuff like that, um, you guys can either uh, indicate, you know, generic nuclei. So, like, you can say a larger nucleus and then smaller nuclei. I'm okay with that. Um... Um, or you can, you know, use specific like uranium-235 as your target nucleus um, and then uh, indicate your fission products, okay? But when you're drawing them, please make sure like the sizes are corresponding in terms of, you know, bigger uh, atom or bigger nuclei versus smaller nuclei. Make sure you're identifying your neutrons and as well as including energy, okay? So nuclear fission, um, it's really cool. Uh, there are some really good things about it. Let's go ahead and quickly look at the pros and cons though. So pros of nuclear fission is that there's lots of energy produced, right? We can power cities. Uh, we used to have um, a power plant just up the road in San Onofre that powered parts of um, Southern California. Uh, we have lots of facilities across the country. Um, typically, you know, we'll see them next to bodies of water so that um, the water can be utilized to heat and cool 
um, the uh, reactors as well as, um, of course, produce steam and things like that that power the turbines. Okay, um, cons are that chain, react chain reactions can get out of control and cause meltdowns. Um, we have, you know, probably heard of Chernobyl, um, the Chernobyl disaster, uh, or maybe even Fukushima. That's probably more recent for some of you guys. Um, but basically, if these chain reactions keep happening and um, you can't get the uranium rods isolated away from the neutrons, they're just going to keep um, going and going and going and releasing more and more heat. And eventually, um, the containment area, um, you know, the concrete and steel and everything that's used to isolate uh, can eventually um, be breached. Um, nuclear waste is obviously a problem, okay? Uh, the products that are produced, uh, you can't do anything to them really um, to make them decay any faster. We just have to sit there and waste, uh, wait um, for them to naturally decay on their own. So, you know, we have barrels of waste um, scattered throughout our country, okay? And it creates lots of uh, uh, discussions in terms of the safety and containment and everything. And then finally, there are nuclear weapons overlap with uh, uh, the enrichment process okay so centrifuges and and such are used to isolate the uranium-235 um, but there's also other isotopes of uranium that can be used in bomb making um, for nuclear weapons so there's always some concern when um, nuclear power is being utilized in in a country okay so nuclear fu fusion is um, kind of a, a unique process and it's a little different than the fission process. So fusion um, is basically when you take two or more atomic nuclei and basically slam them together um, and form a larger nucleus that then breaks down into energy and um, a couple of simple products. Okay, so the two lighter nuclei come together um, and then they it decomposes or breaks down and forms um, smaller products. So if you go ahead and uh, look at the example here, right, so um, we have tritium and deuterium, right, these are both isotopes of hydrogen. Okay, we slam them together, we form a bigger nucleus, um, and then that breaks down into helium here, um, a neutron, and of course a bunch of energy. So um, this process is actually pretty neat, it produces a lot of energy. Um, some ideal things is that it, you know, creates short-lived waste, um, and, you know, theoretically, we have lots of hydrogen in our uh, environment, so we could obviously harness or, or isolate deuterium and tritium to utilize for this process. Um, the issues are it's still really experimental. Um, carrying this out is pretty difficult, it requires very specific conditions, um, and it's really, really hard to make uh, viable. Okay, um, and obviously because it's still in the experimental stages, it's really, really experimental. Uh, expensive. Um, so ideally we could get to where we're using something like this, um, but at this point we're not quite there. So when you're diagramming fusion, um, you can indicate um, with specific examples or uh, you can use, you know, lighter nuclei, heavier nuclei, you know, and then give me the specific products. Okay, so when you're diagramming, make sure you follow those rules, make sure you're familiar with the differences between the two, and that's nuclear fusion.